Good evening. evening. Welcome to worship on this Monday, Thursday. Tonight we find our Savior in the upper room on the night before his death. And there he institutes and shares with his disciples and with us a very special meal. For our service this evening, we'll be following the special order of service as you see it on the screen. One note about the end of the service this evening, there will be no benediction, there will be no blessing at the end of the service. We will close with the closing hymn. And after that, you can sit in silence and and meditate and then usher yourselves out and please leave in silence. The reason we do that is because our service is not over. We will gather tomorrow evening on Good Friday. We will gather in silence once again as we reflect on our Savior's suffering and death. And at the end of that service, there will also not, there will be no benediction, there will be no blessing because again, our service is not over. We will gather once again on Easter Sunday where we rejoice in our Savior's victory over the grave. So we begin now with our opening hymn of praise, hymn 717 in the Blue Supplement.
Grace and peace be yours in abundance through the knowledge of God and of Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, tonight we gather to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which is also known as Holy Communion. A a communion is a joining together, a common union, if you will. And tonight we will look at and, and rejoice in three communions, three common unions found in the Lord's Supper. The first communion in the Lord's Supper is between the bread and wine and Jesus' body and blood. Now if you're at a dinner party and you're wondering what you're eating, maybe all you have to do is look at it and taste it and you know what you are eating. For example, if you are holding an orange in your hand and it tastes like an orange, then you know that you are having an orange. It's a little more difficult, though, if it's meatloaf, right? You can see that there is meat in there and it tastes like meat, but unless your taste buds are really good, it might be hard to decipher exactly what else is in there. If you wanted to know exactly, you would have to ask your host. Well, it's easy to look at and taste the Lord's Supper and realize that wine is present and bread is too. Anyone who would deny this is denying not only their taste buds, but also what God's Word has to say. God's Word says that Jesus took bread. It also says that Jesus referred to the fruit of the vine. But don't let your taste buds or your eyes fool you. There is something else there. Something else is joined. Something else is in union with the bread and the wine. And listen to what our host says. This is my body. This is my blood. Now someone might ask, wasn't Jesus speaking figuratively when he said that? Wasn't he simply saying that the the redness of the wine looked a lot like blood? Or that the bread was like his body? Well, that would be reasonable if I said what Jesus said. If you were at my house and I gave you some bread to eat and I said, this is my body, you would know that I am speaking figuratively. Because clearly my body is still in front of you sitting where it was before. Clearly, my body can't be in two places at the same time. But not with Jesus. He has the ability to be in several places at the same time because he has the ability to do anything. And therefore, if Jesus says, this is my body, we accept that it is his body. We also note that Jesus referred to this as a new covenant. A covenant was a solemn contract, a a binding contract. And like documents today, a covenant called for very precise language. Language that said exactly what it meant. And as the Son of God, Jesus knew that his words would be written down and that that they would be remembered for years and years to come. And so if Jesus wanted us to understand something else, there were a number of other words and phrases that he could have used to convey the meaning of this looks like my body or this represents my blood or this will remind you of my body and blood. But Jesus chose none of those words. If on the other hand, Jesus intended for us to believe that it was truly his body and blood in union with the bread and the wine, then he would have said exactly what he did say. This is my body. This is my blood. We also note that the early New Testament church clearly believed Jesus' body and blood to be truly present. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
Paul says that when we eat and drink, we ought to recognize the body of the Lord. You can't recognize something if it isn't even there. And therefore, the body of the Lord must truly be present in communion. Paul also says that those who receive the sacrament without faith sin against not bread and wine, but the body and blood of the Lord in union with them. Yes, the words of Christ are clear and they stand forever. This is my body. This is my blood. That brings us to the second communion in the Lord's Supper. And that is the communion between sinners and God. Now, there are many different levels of friendship. For example, the people that we went to grade school with or the people that we go to high school with or we went to high school with are people that we might send a Christmas card to. Maybe someone we had talked to every, once every 10 years or so. Or maybe your neighbors are quite friendly with you. you. You talk to them when you both go out to get the mail at the same time. And over the years, you've gotten to know them quite well. But never once have they invited you into their home. And they probably never will. It's just too intimate of a thing. Your friendship isn't at that level, and both of you know it. And then, of course, there are some people you would never invite into your home for a meal because, well, you don't like them and they don't deserve it. Well, that was basically your relationship with God. There was no way that he would invite you to join him at his table. Our relationship with God was that bad. Now, please don't misunderstand me. It isn't that God is like some old, grumpy old man who, whose only joy in life is to yell at the neighbor kids when they step six inches onto his property. No, God is, is like a neighbor who has repeatedly been forced to deal with loud, obnoxious parties. God is like a neighbor who, whose gentle request to just turn down the music a little bit gets the reply of turning the music up even more. God is like the neighbor who loans you a power tool and then when he needs it for a project is told to get lost and to go buy his own. Well, Considering how we have treated God during our lives, we have no reason to expect God to invite us in. In fact, when we think about how we have treated the possessions that God has entrusted to us and how we have failed to keep his commands, it wouldn't be surprising if when we went outside, God would go back inside. Or if he put up a fence between our homes so that there was no chance of us stepping onto his property. And to some degree, that is true. Except we are the ones who have put up the fence. We are the ones who destroyed those neighborly relations because of our sin. As Paul says in his letter to the Colossians, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. And yet God invites us to come, take and eat. Take and drink. Why would God give us such a gracious invitation? Well, the answer is found in the supper itself. It is Christ's body and blood, the same body and blood that we receive in the sacrament that brings God and us together. As Paul goes on to say in Colossians, But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Through Christ's physical body you have been made holy in his sight without blemish. That's exactly what Jesus said when he instituted this meal. He said, this is my body given for you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. These are special words. They assure us that not only is God interested in being our neighbor, he is eager to have us come to his table. Of the the three communions in the Lord's Supper, perhaps this one is the the one that is nearest and dearest to us. 
It assures us that the body and blood we receive have made us worthy of dining with God. Now at his table here on earth and forever at his table in heaven. And that brings us then to the final communion in the Lord's Supper. And that is the communion that believers enjoy with one another. Now, the thing about dinner parties is that, is that sometimes you aren't sure who else is going to be there and whether or not you're going to be able to get along with them. The fact that the host invited you and that he invited someone else doesn't mean that you're going to have a close kinship with that person. For example, if I'm seated next to someone whose interests are poetry and archaeology, we're not going to have a lot to talk about. Even though we're, it, we're eating at the same table, we aren't going to enjoy a, a unity. But if you give us just one thing in common, then there will be a unity. There will be this bond regardless of our different interests or opinions. Those things will seem com comparatively insignificant and irrelevant. Jesus' disciples were individually quite diverse. You had fishermen and tax collectors, zealots and doubters. You had ambitious people and laid-back people. And yet they formed one group. And what was it that bonded them together? Well, in a word, it was Jesus. And Jesus binds us together too. In Jesus we are united, though some of us may be blue-collar and others white-collar, though some are men and some are women, though some are Republicans, some are Democrats. When we come to the Lord's table tonight, we will be united. United in faith. United as sinners who are now saints through the blood of Jesus. And we will be standing next to a Christian, someone with whom we are united in faith. Paul writes, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Tonight, as we stand next to each other at the Lord's table, we rejoice in that union. For as we stand next to each other, we are confessing that we are one. We are united in the faith. For as Paul said, there is one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith. One baptism. Tonight we will receive the Lord's Supper. And as we do so, we recognize the communion of bread and wine in Jesus' body and blood. We rejoice in the communion that we sinners have with our holy God. And we also will be strengthened and encouraged by the union that we enjoy with one another. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all our understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now continue with the instruction for the end of Lent. In this Lenten season, we have heard again how our Lord walked the path of suffering which led him to the cross for our salvation. We have also heard our Lord's call to intensify our struggle against sin, death, and the devil, all that keeps us from loving God and one another. This is the struggle to which we were committed at baptism. God's forgiveness and the power of his Spirit to amend our lives continue with us because of his love for us in Jesus our Savior. Within the family of the church, God never wearies of giving peace and new life, in the absolution, we receive forgiveness as from God himself. This absolution we should not doubt, but firmly believe that our sins are thus forgiven before God in heaven. For it comes to us in the name and by the command of our Lord. We who receive God's love in Jesus Christ are called to love one another, to be servants to each other as Jesus became our servant. In Holy Communion, the members of Christ's body participate most intimately in his love. Remembering our Lord's last supper with his disciples, we eat the bread and drink the cup of this meal. Together we receive the Lord's gift of his body and blood for forgiveness. 
and participate in that new covenant that makes us one with him and one another. The Lord's Supper is the promise of the great banquet we will share with all the faithful when our Lord returns, the joyous culmination of our reconciliation with God and each other. Let us confess our sins to God and ask for his forgiveness. Almighty God, merciful Father, I confess to you that I have not loved you with all my heart in what I have done and left undone. I have pursued my ways instead of your ways. I have not loved my brothers and sisters as myself. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. I am truly sorry for my sins. I repent of them. I beg for your mercy, O Lord. Forgive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for us. Cleanse me from my sins. Release me from my guilt. Grant me your Holy Spirit to amend my sinful life. The Almighty God has been merciful to us and has sent his Son to die for all. For his sake, God forgives our sins and calls us from darkness to his marvelous light. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus Christ has forgiven us and reconciled us to God and has promised us the power to forgive and love each other. Relying on his promise, therefore, be reconciled with one another. Brothers and sisters, May the peace of Christ rule in our hearts, in our words, and in our actions. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, in the sacrament of Holy Communion, you give us your true body and blood as a remembrance of your suffering and death on the cross. Grant us so firmly to believe your words and promise that we may always partake of this sacrament to our eternal good. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson for this Monday Thursday is recorded in Exodus chapter 12. Here God gives his people instructions for the first Passover celebration. We see that the Passover lamb is the center of the celebration. That Passover lamb, which was to be without blemish and defect, is a foreshadow of Christ, the Lamb of God, who would take away the sin of the world. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, This month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. The animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the fourteenth day of the month, when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it till morning. If some is left till morning, you must burn it. This is how you are to eat it, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. 
On that same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn, both men and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. This is a day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. This is the word of the Lord. We join in the psalm of the day, Psalm 116 on page 107 in the front of the red hymnal. Our second lesson is recorded in Hebrews chapter 10. It's through the blood of Jesus that we enjoy the forgiveness of sins and the sure hope of eternal life. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. This is the word of the Lord. As often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. 
Please stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for Monday, Thursday is recorded in Luke chapter 22. Here Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? they asked. He replied, As you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters, and say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We continue with the hymn of the day, hymn 135.
Please stand for prayer. We join in the response of prayer of the church for Monday, Thursday. Lord God, Heavenly Father, author of the everlasting covenant and giver of the cup of salvation. For fulfilling your promise to establish a new covenant through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. As our Lord Jesus Christ gave thanks to you when he broke the bread, as he gave thanks to you when he took the cup, we also give you thanks. Precious Savior, both priest and offering, awe and wonder fill our hearts as we partake of your body broken for us and your blood shed for us. In our poverty of righteousness, we have nothing to offer. Without your tremendous sacrifice, we would still be in our sins. O Holy Spirit, dwell within us as we remember our Lord's death in this sacrament. Enter our hearts to strengthen our faith and fill us with gratitude for your great mercy. Hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. As our Lord served his disciples by washing their feet, so may we also humbly serve one another. Help us live our lives as sacrifices of thanksgiving to the end of the eternal love of God. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, I encourage you to continue preparing your hearts and minds for receiving the Lord's Supper. Please stand. We continue with the liturgy for Holy Communion on page 22 in the front of the blue supplement. Page 22. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God.
It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil, who overcame us by a tree, would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand. We join to sing the song of Simeon. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for our closing hymn. 